The illicit trade in antiquities is estimated to be worth nearly $10 billion a year. 11,000, your bid. In the night, from this closed this space, these objects disappeared. UK museums have been put under renewed pressure to investigate the origin of thousands of allegedly stolen artifacts. To me, this is an imperial prison. The room is full of colonial plunder. There are so many objects that we don't know much about because they've disappeared into private collections. To steal them and call it a business is a crime. A growing number of social media activists in India and Nepal are mobilizing to reclaim what they believe is rightfully theirs. Active users, we would talk about 2,000 people. If they are not listening to us, they will start listening after it goes out in the social media. So it's a 100% match, the measurements match, the stylization matches. If we get killed, we will be killed as a person who was working for a cause. When you go to any of the cultural heritage sites, especially in the morning, you'll see how the rituals are performed. We have to touch and feel the deity. You know, we put tikka on the forehead, we pour milk, we spread grains, we put fruits, and then slowly, after years and years, it will lose its, its contour, right? and eventually it will convert into a stone. They need to be worshipped. It was never meant to stay inside a glass box or in a, in a pedestal. In a way, it's very disgusting for us to kind of see it in that way. The best part about the social media is like if any institutions or any auction houses or any private collectors, if they are not listening to us, they will start listening after it goes out in the social media. It becomes big and big and big. With the Bonham auction, right, with it, it was first identified by the Lost Arts of Nepal. And we don't know where this person is. We don't know how this person operates. They're anonymous, right? And the best part, what I've seen with Lost Arts of Nepal is whoever runs that page has got a wealth of information, wealth of evidences. They were personally in touch with us, and they were trying to find out how we can stop the auction. Bonhams is one of the auction houses, one of the you know, big auction houses. It's based in France. And they auctioned these five objects. And the idea is like, how can we stop them? Each of these pieces was priced around $3,000 to $5,000. You know, we could easily find the location. The location was mentioned. It was from Patan Mall shop. What you're seeing now is uh, the replicas. And if you look at the old image, it looked horrible. You can see 
how that door looks, and then above the door, it's completely empty, right? There are no gods and goddesses. Everything is missing. It is uh, believed that it happened between 1970s and 18s. You know, lots of peoples were here, lots of probably gods were here, right? But uh, in the night, from this closed this space, these objects disappeared. So it's quite amazing, you know, how those objects left this courtyard and reached to Bonhams. These objects are almost uh, 600 years old. These are made from uh, copper, they're gilded, and uh, it, ha it has a high demand in the West. Each of these pieces were priced around $3,000 to $5,000. All those resources and evidences were there, but we knew that it would be very difficult to deal with France in many cases. We're running out of time. The auction was meant to begin in 24 hours. Then we started speaking with our advisory council. You know, they were supporting us. They were connecting us with different people. They were emailing us. And eventually, Bonhams were tagged on Twitter. And uh, it was, they were also tagged in Instagram. There was a newspaper article came, you know, how you know, with all the evidence and all the facts. And I think they had too much push. And within 24 hours, they were able to kind of announce that they have withdrawn the auction from the, from the website and it was taken away. That was a very fulfilling experience, you know. Uh, but the sad part is we don't know how to get it back because it's in France. So it's, it's a very tricky, tricky, tricky situation. We have got no fun to bring it back to Nepal. I'm Roshan Misra. I work as a volunteer at the Nepal Heritage Recovery Campaign. Besides that, I work as a director at the Taragao Museum in Kathmandu. So you can look at this one here, above the Kirti Mukha. Right? That is also a new carving. Maybe the old one was lost long ago. In a simple language, I think it's an effort to bring our culture heritage back to our own country, to the people whom it belongs to. One more tray. And that is the only trace that is left in the tower. NHRC is a very small team. It's a very grassroots kind of a organization, you know? You know, we are five, six of us, and we all are busy with our own day-to-day -day jobs. So there are lots of challenges. Definitely, we are inspired by the Indapurit project. You know, everybody from all around the world support them. And it will take us some time to gain the same kind of, you know, followers. Whenever I talk with Vijay Kumar, it's always inspiring. His passion level has never gone down. Yeah, no, 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 we have crossed 300 since 2014. Uh, we hope to go over 1,000 in the coming years. Not a single one of them have been paid for. So it takes about 8,000 hours to, to track a single artifact. 
and we are now tracking or we are looking for about over 10,000 objects. Bulk of them are in the US, UK, France and Australia. Active users, we would talk about 2,000 people who are actively contributing. And our request is very simple. You want to be part of our team, you go anywhere in Europe, you are in America, you see a shop floor uh, having an Indian art object, take a photo if it's not risky for you. And each one of them who have contributed images from museums all over the world is a volunteer. Take the case of uh, the Oxford Ashmolean Museum, for example. This particular bronze of Trimange Alva, the Ashmolean was provided the evidence in 2018 about the stolen bronze. It is in the Jamil Center, first floor, room 32. That's where all the Indian artifacts from 600 AD are kept. I'm hoping it's, it's going to be there, but I'm not sure. There are lots of people in the Western world trying to raise campaigns and form political pressure groups to get governments and, and organizations to return artifacts back. I'm visiting Ashmolean today to collect some data, things like photographs and videos to be sent to Vijay and the India Pride project. I'm Santil Kumar Balasubramanian. I am a tech entrepreneur and an investor. We live in uh, Buckinghamshire, not too far from Oxford. Well, I came to the UK in 2005 to do my postgrad in uh, device physics at the University of Bristol. I came across the India Pride project. I reached out to Vijay maybe a year ago, and um, yeah, I've been uh, volunteering with IPP for the last year or so. At this time, I'm going to go and look for uh, the Tirumangai Alvar statue. We believe it was stolen in 1957, and the Indian government quite recently, in February 2020, requested the Ashmolean Museum to return it back. So it seems like nothing has changed. There has been significant delay in repatriation of this said statue. Room 32, India from AD 600. To me, this is an imperial prison. The room is full of uh, colonial loot and colonial plunder. But again, the same sense of injustice. To think of that, some of these statues were made by people when there was no England or when there was no, not even, not even Anglo-Saxons or Romans, and it's it's overwhelming. And I think we are right here next to next to Tirumangai Alvar, and this is the statue that's in contention. To me, uh, holding someone else's cultural artifacts is embarrassing to the people doing it. It's a bit bizarre to see uh, a statue outside the, a sacred place. As you can see, it's standing majestically, waiting to be repatriated. And there is even a sign that says, that it could have been stolen. Well, it is stolen, so you better get your act together. <laughs> it's not just enough to put a poster on a wall and say, well, we've done our best. I don't think that's good enough. We do this every month, uh, and it, it is good for us that every month we meet here, gather here, we talk about our experience. <laughs> Vidhi Baba Pradhan, who is our chairperson, she's a retired civil servant. To American to former diplomat, Pita Diju Vanigo. Yes, go already, Metropolitan Museum, Asa. Our vice chair, Kanakmani Dixit, he's a well-known journalist. 
तो भाई को पांच वाला इमेज आइली समान मेरे बिचारे ना सोशल मीडिया में गोकुबन चाइन तेला हम भी पोस्ट करने सकते हैं तो चाइनी इंटरेस्टिंग होता है एंड देन संजय अधिकारी ही इज़ द लॉयर एंड देन ही इज़ ही इज़ टू द पॉइंट यू नो ही इज़ फैक्ट बेस्ड पर्सन वही आइने सब पे को ठीक सा मतलब ये वाला बहुत चि� so every single case, he's like amazing. Like he finds all the information, he work makes all the paperwork that is required. Now all these museums, they want to see evidences. They want to know all the facts and figures. And if we are not able to supply that, these objects will never come back. My current focus is on Ashivalinga. Lost Arts of Nepal has located it in the Art Institute of Chicago. We believe it was stolen from Pashpatna Temple, and I am working to try and prove it. A lot of things has already been looted from Pashpatna. If we can't bring the Shivalinga back, uh, it will be kept in the museum. When Nepal was opened to the uh, West in the 60s, there was an influx of all the hippies, you know, artists, architects, photographs, all sort of people came. In the 60s, when uh, you know Nepal was open to the rest of the world, till 90s, I think roughly 70 to 80 percent of our heritage, cultural properties, dissipated from this country, and uh, mostly they are scattered around uh, Europe and America. The way I see it is, once it's stolen, I think the Nepali authorities have only two, three months to kind of really look for it. Once it's disappeared from the country, what will happen is it will stay underground. We think the Shivalinga was smuggled across the Nepal-India border in 1984. Then it reappeared at Sotheby's auction in London. It was then bought by some wealthy art collectors, the Alstrop family, and transported to the US. In the 2000s, it was donated to the Art Institute of Chicago, where it is today. The Alsop collection is a big collection. It's a private collector, and the family has been giving their collection to different museums around the world, and that's how their collection is displayed in different museums, you know? If you, if you look at some of the private collectors, you know, family picture, or, you know, when they're having you know, potting or they, when they're standing around their house, you see these objects behind, you know. And it's quite amazing to see that some are standing in the hallway, some are in the living room, some are in the kitchen, some are in the oh, nearby the swimming pool area, you know. It's quite amazing. And I'm, I'm just thinking, like, were they really made for that purpose? You look at all these collections around the world, all the auction houses, all the museums, institutions, universities, sometimes it's heartbreaking. So this is the area from where the uh, God the Shivalinga was actually stolen in 1984. So this is the place from where it was stolen. The backside, the wall and other portion is still the same. See? Oh, Jindai, Jai, Bole. What are you? Have you heard that you are not the only one who has been stolen from the government? Bole, Jai, Bole, Nunja. 
uh, I just called uh, some of the locals of this place. So he said that uh, he don't have much idea about it. So he's going to send us a number of one of the senior person. Dai, hello. Good day, Namaste. Ma, Sanjay Adhikari. I'm here to see you. 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 I'm here to This man said he grew up around here and remembers the Shivalinga being here. I will submit his testimony along with the photographic evidence. I hope it's enough to convince the museum to return it. Right now, uh, we are entering the Chola, heart of the Chola land. Chola bronzes are considered, uh, I would say, that the high water mark of Indian art. Uh, actually, it's high water mark of world art. Despite informing the Ashmolean in 2018 of the stolen bronze, it's been four years now, we don't have our bronze back. I think from our own side, we've given time enough for the current holders to do the right thing. I think it's time we get more aggressive and get the local communities involved. I'm heading to the temple from where the bronze was stolen 50 years ago to meet the priest and update them on our investigation. I need their help to put pressure on the Ashmolean and spread word in the media. We have archival photography by the French Institute of Pondicherry in 1957. In fact, it's dated 22nd of June 1957. So it's a 100% match and the measurements match, the stylization matches. Matthew Bogdan and Nason told me. So, they told me that they were going to sell it. They told me that they were going to sell it. They were going to sell it on the website. It was said to be from Sundara Perumal. What did they do? 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 I'm going to tell them what they do. 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 When the bronze was stolen way back in 1957, the robbers replaced it with a fake, a replica, which is still being worshipped today. In the coil, there was a lot of people who were in the coil. There was a lot of people who were in the coil. There was a lot of people who were in the coil. There was a lot of people who were in the coil. There was a lot of people we will bring the woosh one shape. These two days, you will have all room to burn as battle to the people. The priests and the temple community have offered us their full support. The ball is now in the Ashmolean court to do the right thing. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put it here. OK. Because last time we didn't have it, and it was a pain not having... It's always quite nerve-wracking the hour before the auctions, but I'm, I'm fairly confident it's going to be a, a good day. I would say 
The percentage of Chinese clients bidding in the auction today will be probably close to 80 or 90 percent. Predominantly, the market is dominated by Chinese buyers and Chinese money returning the objects back to, the, to their countrymen. There's a great pride in bringing things back to China for Chinese nationals. Uh, used by the uh, mm -hmm. oh, really interesting I mean um, Chinese clients generally are much younger than the art and antiques clients that you might find in Britain in 2020 the average age of my client that I would be selling to would be someone wearing a Nike Air Jordans with a big Rolex watch probably and wearing tracksuit um, and generally, they were under the age of 30. You probably don't want glasses on top of my head, do you? Hmm? My name is Alastair Gibson, and uh, I'm a Chinese ceramics specialist and auctioneer. Lot 73 uh, has been the most controversial lot within our auction. Uh, it is a silver flask, which is dated to 1852 and was taken from the Summer Palace uh, in the Second China Wars in 1860. I don't do think if I get it, this is a very important in China. Very important? Yeah, that's a piece. I think it's... You are Ming Yuan have said it has come from Send it from you. I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, there aren't that many of them. The major London auction houses or international auction auction houses wouldn't sell it for fear of upsetting China. The sale is contentious for a couple of reasons. The Chinese obviously are very upset with the fact that we burnt down the summer palace as a retaliation for the mistreatment of prisoners during the China Wars. The upset when these things appear on the market is fairly deep. Andrew, you're all okay to good to go? Yeah? You're okay, Carl? Yes. What time did you make it? 10.30. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Well, uh, after a long discussion and with consultation with the diplomats based here at the embassy, Chinese embassy in London, we have decided to withdraw it from the auction. This is um, a letter from the Army Yuan Management Office, uh, and it, it basically outlines their objection to us selling it at auction. Well, I was expecting it, to be honest with you. So we call on international friends in the spirit of humanism and jointly boycott the auction selling of illegally lost cultural relics that are suspected of looting from war and promote the return of cultural relics by all necessary means. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, today's sale. Uh, just one sale of announcement to make today, lot 73 the silver hunting flask, we have withdrawn that from the auction at the request of the Chinese government. So without further ado, lot number one, showing you on your screen there. I mean, obviously, we are sympathetic to, to their loss. However, if all the Chinese art was solely concentrated in China, does it actually promote Chinese art to a worldwide audience? Really? 9,000 now. So I think it's probably better that it's scattered in various museums around the world. So I think it adds to the world understanding of Chinese art and culture. 5'8 now. 
I think I'm very well placed to sell other objects of this type because very few people have had the experience in doing so, uh, in dealing with the Chinese directly. Um, it's a sensitive subject. It needs to be handled delicately. 11,000, your bid. One, two, nine. Thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. So not many people have seen this. This is a special access. What you see here are the replica of the stolen sculptures. And this is a replica of uh, Vishnu, which was uh, stolen from a very prominent place uh, called Changu Narayan. So this is from 6th century, very old sculpture, also stolen from Patan. I started to think, what can I do? You know, what can I do? How can I uh, make uh, people aware? And then the, the concept of museum of stolen art came in my mind. I'm Rabindra Puri and I, I have been working in the field of uh, art theft since last 20 years. The, the Museum of Stolen Art is not only going to be the uh, exhibition of replica, we are going to dramatize it so that when any Nepali go in there, their heart must weep and their blood must boil. We want to make our people aware about how big the art theft problem in this country, you know. I hope that we can open the museum end of 2023. <laughs> Complete gone like what the other cut time last all. Kitchen is a man. Now let's see. Now let's get thirteen minutes left. So I I often come to this place to check how the uh, the replica is progressing. Yes, ma. What the mistake was? Yes, sir. Tashi, yes, sir. What the? Thirteen. I'm I'm so proud of our artisans. You know, they are really unbelievable. You know. Yeah, the pressure is on because we want to complete uh, the, all the replicas by the end of this year. We have already done 36, so we still have to do 14 more. So the pressure is really on now. When we open the museum, I would like to speak directly to the Western museums. Please give us back our deities and we are going to give you the replica. Providing them replica could be a good solution. I hope one day uh, our museum will be empty and all our temples are again full of our deities. So that's my goal. We're actually going to um, the World Culture Store, which is where I do most of my work. Most museums were basically storehouses for empire and art, I suppose. And uh, so over the centuries, they've amassed enormous quantities of material. We have well over a million pieces, but uh, only about 1% of our holdings are ever on display. So they have the rest of the, the collection has to be put somewhere. Well, my name is Patricia Allen, and I'm the curator of world cultures here at Glasgow Museums.
I look after all the artifacts that uh, were collected from the formerly colonized nations. So there are 3,000 pieces from India. Our big museums, I think, would be rather emptier without a lot of the Indian antiquities that they have. Well, these pieces are only ours for another 10 days. These objects are all going to be repatriated to India, but it's a bit of a process. This is the biggest repatriation ever. That's the biggest from any museum in Scotland. And we're quite a small museum, really. We're repatriating a total of seven pieces to India. The date range is from about the 10th century until the mid 19th century. Well, I'll start with these pillars. Um, these were the first I'd identified. And it's very, when you examine it, it's very obviously been taken from a temple. And I thought, this has been looted, this has been removed. This one, it looks very unprepossessing, but if you really um, look closely, it is stunning. But again, it was, we haven't, we don't know why it was looted, but it was just taken. So you can see in the photograph I found, so there was a little slot in each alcove, so the, these would have been placed in there and attached to the wall behind. And there was just a whole wall full of these. You know, we don't have such huge resources but the sheer amount of work is extraordinary. Um, and the cost is an issue as well. It's just dogged determination, I think. It's the right time to start thinking about these things. In the UK, I think since independence is the first time a colonial artifact, at least a museum has promised to give back. This is indeed a very small first step uh, because only one of the artifacts is actually a temple idol. We hope this leads to many more UK and other erstwhile colonial powers to relook at their collections and do the right thing. Of course, there's a photo opportunity. Of course, politics are, are part of it. It's, it is hugely expensive and time consuming. And so it will not open the floodgates. It is always a block. It's always something that people are, even within the museum profession, people are slightly alarmed, it's slightly uneasy. They do say things like, um, we won't have anything left. But as I said, seven out of one million is really, you know, not a floodgate. It's not even a trickle. It's a slight, maybe a, a little bit of a drop of water. The day that the last crate is nailed shut and they're out of this building, I will know how I feel. I would say this is one of IPP's biggest success stories. This is the first time I'm visiting the temple since the repatriation. He's been the star attraction. Every, everybody is now coming here to worship. And uh, it's, 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 you can see, this, this place used, used to get about 10, 15 people. Now thousands are visiting this temple to just see him as well. I generation, I 
ஆராக்கிறவராக நான் வந்திருக்கிறேன் கடந்த இரண்டு ஆண்டுகளுக்கு முன்னால் இந்த சாமி கிடச்சிருக்கு உங்கள் சாமி தான் எனக்கு ஐடி பீஸ் சொல்ல முடியுமா அப்படின்னு கேட்டாங்க அதனால் அவங்க எனக்கு சாமி அடையாளம் சொன்ன உடனே உடனே போட்டோ கட்டி சாமி இதாயா எங்கள் சாமி அப்படின்ற உடனே உடனே சொல்ல இதா எங்கள் சாமி அது வரும் அதுக்கு ரெண்டு வருஷம் ஒன்றுமே தெரியல கட்டில் போட்டு கட்டி பார்த்து திடீர்னு போன ஒருத்தர் ஒரு சாமியெலாம் வந்திருக்கு பேப்பரில் பார்த்தேன் டெல்லியில் அரை வாங்கினாங்க குமாரத்தை பார்த்தோன்னே அப்படி கல்ல செலவு ஐம்பத்தேழு வருஷங்கள் கழித்து இந்த சாமியை பார்க்குறேன்னு அப்படி இருக்கும் என்னுடைய குழந்தை மாதிரி நான் வந்துருக்கேன் மேடி லைட்டாக இருந்தது ஒரு அஞ்சு அரை கேமரா வச்சுருக்கோம் இப்போ நிறையா ரெண்டு ஆம்பூர் போலீஸ் வேறு போட்டிருக்காங்க நைட் காவலுக்காக so normally god did not need safety they were supposed to be the other way around they were supposed to take care of the population inge or camera work pannunde idu inda id pura paakala adhe me inda vaasal la entrance la varudhu paakala inda negamra sharp ah irukku kaiye kuchu we had priest being uh, killed custodians watchmen being killed if somebody is going to pay a million dollars for icons what amount of security in india you think can protect it looting in india is still extremely high in the last 20 years more than 1200 thefts have been reported in temples of tamil nadu alone the illegal trafficking of antiquities is still very much a thriving business our laws are very weak our borders of are, are very uh, let's say open there is uh, an element of corruption that is there as well and today thanks to the internet it's anonymous anybody can buy anybody can sell no names are disclosed and these objects fade away into oblivion i think we got to be careful because uh, what i would say is there are still active group of people who are trading cultural object right they were aware about the work that we do but i won't let that stop us i don't tell a lot of things to my family uh, my family usually knows much about my teaching about my legal profession but not much about my campaigns so i don't share the threat uh, that i get with my family and my friends because they might get worried about it if we get killed we will uh, be killed as a person who was working for a cause so this is what motivates us every day to work and it creates problem to a lot of people in one hand side i'm risking my life but i don't care because i have always done what my heart told me to do or what my heart tells me it's a living culture you know like people are going there to pray and people have such a big faith on these sculptures so to steal them and and call it a business is a crime Initially, we were thinking that you know when we started the re- repatriation campaign, we may be able to get a one or two a year, and then to have five at one go, like yeah, it was a bit more. Yeah. So it was quite an emotional moment. Sanjay ji was able to witness this moment. So I'm sure it was very overwhelming. I felt really emotional. It is so satisfying, you know, to uh, see the fruits of your labor. One of these objects was the sculpture Sanjay was investigating at the Pashupatinath temple, the Shivalinga. 
Yeah, so it was it was quite uh, quite amazing moment. So it, it's it's wonderful, you know. I believe when we take Shivalinga back to Pashpatna, there will be a huge festival. Traditional instrument will be played, the community will be involved, the government will be involved. There will be a huge celebration for this. Every evening I go to Pashpatinath. When I come to this place, I have the sensation of the feeling of we. It's not I, you, but this connects us together. So that is why the heritage is important for me, for the people here. All the members of the community come together. The world is a common family. We need to start respecting each other's culture. Once we start doing that, I think the world be will become more dignified. And I think it's all about, it's everything is linked with culture and belief, right? And it, it's about passing it from one generation to another generation so that the culture remains intact. Otherwise, the linkage between the past and the future will be gone.